than that. So at the end of my story, uh, I want you to uh, be reflecting on people in your life who embodied those words, those ideas. My hometown of Twin Falls, Idaho, is uh, famous not just for potatoes. It's also famous for Shoshone Falls, 212 feet high, almost 1,000 feet wide. And then overlooking the falls, there's the jump site when in 1960 or 1973, Evil Knievel made his attempt to jump over the Snake River Canyon. So that's, uh, that's Twin Falls, Idaho, my hometown. On the way into town on Highway 93, there's a sign that has been replaced many times and repaired many times. It says, Welcome to Twin Falls, Idaho, home of Shoshone Falls, higher than Niagara. But no matter how many times it's been replaced and repaired, and the vandalism has been corrected, somebody is always coming along and scratching out one of the legs of the N. So it says, higher than Viagra. (laughs) The measure of a man. That is the question. So there are a number of different ways that when I was growing up, we tested our testosterone. Uh, One of them was uh, hunting. It was a part of a gun culture in Idaho. And fathers would take their sons out. Sometimes mothers would take their daughters out. They'd go hunting in the fall for rooster pheasants. And then kids would come to school with these long, beautiful, tapered rooster uh, tail feathers. And we'd wear them in our hat or we'd make a pen out of them. And I really wanted one of those feathers. But I was never good at hunting because I could somehow see their eyes, even if the pheasant was a long ways away or the deer was around the corner, I could see their eyes. So I was never a good hunter. My father was never um, very helpful around the house with my mother because he said he was in, his role was not housework, He, he was in charge of truck maintenance. Twice, I remember he took me out to try to teach me how to drain the crankcase of its oil, and both times we drained the transmission fluid. (laughs) The primary way that you would prove yourself as a real man was on the athletic field. So I went out for football and basketball and track and cross country, and I know what you're thinking. He was short, (laughs) but I was also very slow. (laughs) So I could tell you a dozen stories of uh, my failure to prove myself on the athletic field, uh, but I'll just tell you one. Robert Stewart Jr. High is standing uh, O'Leary Jr. High. O'Leary always wins. But Robert Stewart, my team, is ahead by three points. And there's less than a minute left in the game. They had just scored. The ref gives me the ball, and out of the corner of my eye, I see him start counting. And I need to throw the ball in. But all I can see in front of me is the 66 jersey of Larry Blackwood, who blocks my whole field of vision. I can't see my team. I can't see the court. I can't see anything. So in desperation, as the ref keeps counting down, I just rear back and I heave the ball as hard as I can, and it hits the back of the backboard above my head, bounces off the wall behind me, and hits me in the head. O'Leary scores. Now we're just ahead by one. The ref hands me the ball underneath the basket, and I hear the whole Robert Stewart cheering section go, Oh, no. (laughs) So Coach Reynolds calls a timeout, 
and they replace me with this tall, athletic kid. He throws the ball in, and we beat O'Leary by one point. No thanks to me. <laughs> so I failed in many different ways to prove myself as a man. Uh, I was coming of age um, during Vietnam. And there was My Lai massacre, and there was uh, the integration of uh, lunch counters, and cities were burning, and bras were burning, and draft cards were burning. And into this divide, I think as deep and as contentious as the divide that exists in our country today, stepped this icon of patriotism, evil Knievel dressed in his motorcycle leathers with his red, white, and blue cape. The wide world of sports, every Saturday afternoon at 5 o'clock, we'd turn it on to hear Kurt Gowdy say, traveling the world to give you the constant variety of sports, the thrill of victory, the agony of defeat. You know that part. The human drama of, ath of athletic competition. This is ABC's wide world of sports. Of the top ten most viewed wide world of sports, Evil Knievel had seven of them. They watched him and they filmed him as he jumped over, you know, um, Caesar's Palace, the cars there, and he w was at Wembley Stadium and jumping over 17 semis. We had this toy made by Ideal that was an evil Knievel toy. So you had this energizer. It was this plastic tower that had a handle, and you'd rev it up, and you'd put evil Knievel on his motorcycle in this charger, and according to the ads on TV, he would ride off into the distance or he'd do a loop-de-loop. -loop. In fact, when you let him go, he'd go about six inches and fall over. <laughs> but that didn't stop us from pretending that we were evil Knievel with our stingray bikes and our elevated handlebars and our banana seats. We'd jump over Tonka trucks and we'd <laughs> jump over Bill Miller's little sister and... <laughs> So we were pretending that we were evil Knievel. Now, as I got older, I became a little more disenamored of him, but there was something about him that was enchanting. I remember uh, in physics class in high school, I didn't like the math of physics, but I liked the demonstrations of physics. I mean, there were these ordinary objects that collided with each other or interacted and, and somehow they were transformed or changed, something happened. It was like a story, the demonstration. So we come into class one day and Mr. Barris has a tennis ball in his hand and he's throwing it up towards the ceiling and catching it and throwing it up towards the ceiling and catching it. And he started talking about this thing called escaped velocity. He says the tennis ball accelerates out of my hand and then it, uh, the gravitational field of the earth pulls it back down to the earth. But the further it gets away from the center of the gravitational field, the weaker that field is. And the more you accelerate it, you could escape the captivity of gravity and be launched into outer space. And... I was thinking about how Evil Knievel was born in Butte, Montana, a little town, sort of like my own town, and he managed to escape from that town to fame and fortune, and maybe I could learn something from him. Escape velocity. That's what I needed. So when he decided to jump the Snake River Canyon, he tried it in Arizona first, but the Department of Interior wouldn't let him jump the Grand Canyon. So he went to Idaho to the Snake River to try to jump it there. I was a sophomore in college at the College of Idaho in Caldwell, Idaho. 
And I drove the 160 miles to be there, to be witness to this jump over the canyon. I was there on the hood of my 1963 Chevy Impala with Susie Woods, my girlfriend at the time, and we were waiting for it to happen. There were 30,000 people there. The population of Twin Falls was only about 15,000, but this was a big deal. It was being televised by the wide world of sports, and people in Twin Falls had decided, you know, by this time we realized that Evil Knievel was sort of uh, greed and narcissism wrapped in red, white, and blue, (laughs) but this was an opportunity to put Twin Falls on the map. And we could make some money at it. So all these people came up with these uh, economic adventures. They were going to have a vending shop for this or hot dogs or beer or whatever. And they were going to make some money out of Evil Knievel's visit. So I'm sitting with Susie on the hood of my car and we're waiting for the launch. And off in the distance we hear this roar of a jet engine. It's really not a motorcycle. It's more like a rocket ship. And we see the smoke rising on the horizon. And then something just over the horizon pops up and then disappears. And Susie looks at me and She says, is that it? Is it done? And I was sort of embarrassed to say, yeah, I think it is. So it was a flop. Um, The debate still goes on today whether he chickened out or if there was a technical flaw. But... People in Twin Falls, Idaho today don't have a very high estimate of Evil Knievel. My friend Constant Perkins was waitress at uh, the Holiday Inn, and she tells stories about Evil Knievel coming in with his entourage and busting up the place and being rude and leaving no tip. The... uh, The security that was secured by Evil Knievel was the Hells Angels. What could go wrong with that? (laughs) So they turned over a beer truck and handed out beer to everybody. And nobody made money except for the Schneider brothers. They made money because they had built 200 outhouses for the event. (laughs) 123 of them were burned to the ground, but they had the foresight to insure them. And so they, they made money. The reporter from the uh, Salt Lake Tribune, I'm very interested to see uh, your program for today, the, um, you know, values of a hippie. That's, that's my people. And then Woodstock, the reporter from Salt Lake uh, called it uh, the evil twin of Woodstock. It was Idaho's Sodom and Gomorrah. (laughs) So I left the next day because I had an appointment back on campus with my major advisor, Dr. Lyle Stanford. Now, this was definitely coming back to earth. You exit off the freeway to get to the college, and if you miss the sign with your eyes, you can detect it with your nose because it's right next to the stockyards. So you exit, and then you go right, left, right, left, and through the stockyards, and the sign says, The College of Idaho, founded in 1897. I had an appointment with my advisor, Dr. Stanford. You take one look at him and you know in his electric wheelchair with his crutches beside him that he is not going to jump 17 semis. In 1947 and 48, when there was a polio epidemic, he contracted polio. But he used that time to teach himself how to paint watercolor paints, and I think I would give my right arm 
to have one of his paintings, usually of the Sawtooth Mountains in central Idaho where I loved to go hiking with my brother. I had an appointment at two with him. Dr. Stanford, you know, we just had the first Earth Day in 1970. Um, This is um, just a few years after that. Dr. Stanford is one of the first scientists to study this new discipline of zoology, of science, called ecology. Rather than studying individual, isolated uh, species, genus, phylum, class, individual, unique, separate from everything else, he was beginning to recognize that everything, 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 is connected in this giant web, including human beings, and we're utterly, utterly dependent on each other and the wider world. So at 2 o'clock, I go into his office just as he's lifting his legs up underneath the desk and putting his crutches beside him. And he says, come on in, Mr. Bland, sit down. Well, there's no place to sit in his office. Everything is covered with books and papers and uh, specimens. He points to a chair. It's piled high with books and papers. He said, just set them someplace else. There's no place else to set them. He said, put them on the floor. Put them on the floor. I sit down and, and we talk. It's like he's got all the time in the world to spend with me. And we talk about Hans Tiefel's ethics class that I'm really enjoying. And we talk about organic chemistry that I'm flunking. It ends up being the place where I get called to go into ministry. God speaks to me more clearly than I've ever heard God. What in the world are you doing in this class? (laughs) So it's like he's got all the time to talk with me. And then at the end of about an hour, I get up and I put the books and papers back in the chair. I start to leave and at the door, I turn and I say, Oh, incidentally, Dr. Stanford, I've decided to be a teacher. And he says, Mr. Bland, come back. Sit down. So I take the books and papers off the chair. I sit down. He said, What did you say? I said, what, when? Oh, I said, I'm going to be a teacher. He said, that's not all you said. I thought about it for a while. Oh, I said, incidentally, I've decided I want to be a teacher. He picks up his crutch and he jabs it in the air in my direction. He said, Mr. Bland, I never, ever, ever want to hear you say, incidentally, I've decided to be a teacher. You decide to be a teacher courageously. You decide to be a teacher intentionally. You decide to be a teacher with passion. Do you understand me? I said, yeah. yeah." And I got up. I put the books and papers back in the chair. I got to the door and he said, oh, Mr. Bland, incidentally, I think you'll make a wonderful teacher. I graduated with a degree in zoology in 1975, and in 1976, Dr. Stanford uh, died of a massive coronary. His gravestone is in this little town called Weezer, Idaho. Now, when one of the publicity stunts that uh, Evil Knievel used was he made this eight-foot granite tombstone uh, in case he died in his attempt to jump over the Grand Canyon. And it became the gravestone in Butte where he's buried today. And you can see it for a half a mile away. In contrast, Dr. Stanford's gravestone is about eight inches off the ground. It says Dr. Lyle Stanford and dates of his birth and death, 1910 to 1976, which made him the same age that I am today, 66. And then just three words, teacher, artist, environmentalist. 
And as far as I'm concerned, he was, for me, an embodiment of freedom and responsibility. He was the measure of a man. So I'd like you to think about those people in your life that uh, embodied either, you know, license, freedom without responsibility, or freedom and responsibility. Who incarnated those wonderful words so that they took flesh and lived for you? Think about it, reflect on it a little bit. If you want to turn to a neighbor, take a moment and Share a story about somebody in your life who made that kind of um, impression about freedom and responsibility. Did you think of someone? I did. It's no fair making Melissa Bush cry because she's the song lead. <laughs> I'm a little verklempt. <laughs> so, but that's okay. The show must go on. Okay. So our closing hymn is 116, I'm on my way. If you rise and body your spirit. And I'll get a little less verklempt when we sing. <laughs>
won't you please remain standing as we say together our chalice, ex chalice extinguishing words. Though we extinguish the chalice, our connection to each other and this community remains. May its light guide us this week as we walk the path of justice, speak words of love, and fill our world with compassion until we meet again. So Spirit has um, taken our hearts of stone and turned them into hearts of flesh. So put your hands in front of you again, if you would. The ability of the heart to pump blood through us and inspire us um, is because it's responsible enough to pump and free enough to release, pump and release. Pump and release, pump and release. Spirit has given you a heart for something. I don't know what it is. Each of us different. For me, it's climate justice. For you, it might be the neighbor across the street who is going through chemotherapy. It may be kids in camps in abusive situations. Spirit has given you a heart. What has Spirit given you a heart for? I want you to call out whatever is on your heart now. How has Spirit given you a heart for? Patients with dementia. People with dementia. Here's what I want to say. Bless your heart. <laughs> bless your heart with courage and bless your heart with compassion and bless your heart with love. Amen. I'm so glad you became a...